Greetings of Peace. Today we are bringing to you a conversation with Nadima Jogi, an educationist and community activist from South Africa. The conversation is titled Separate and Unequal Understanding Education in South Africa. And the main question that we are going to discuss is whether an education system can perpetuate inequality. So join us in this conversation with Nadima Jogi from South Africa. Nadima comes from a family of educators and her passion and specific interests are children, education, language, and social justice. Nadima worked at Praesa, which is Project for the Study of Alternative Education in South Africa from 2004 to 2012 where she had the opportunity to work closely with esteemed South African educationist, Neville Alexander. And I would encourage all our participants who do not know about Neville Alexander to do a bit of search, you know, on the net or send us questions or send Nadima questions because he really was somebody who showed us uh, the way in many, many ways. It's not just about South Africa, but about education in general. And so it's great that Nadima uh, had the opportunity to, to work with him for a long time. She worked, uh, Nadima worked in the early literacy unit. This work evolved around the implementation of the language and education policy at various levels through research in schools, building a culture of reading in communities, and working with in-service teachers. Currently, Nadima works in pre-service teacher education, curriculum development, and building more literate school communities in Nelson Mandela Bay, South Africa. Her interests focus broadly on ways of integrating communities into schools, and more specifically, on community-led ways of learning within school spaces. Before I pass on the mic to my colleague Sami Dosani, who will be doing this conversation with Nadima, I just want to point out as a peace education organization, we really encourage questions and comments and observations. So please do use the chat function. If you are on Facebook, use the comment function, although it is a bit harder for us to answer you there, but we will try. And uh, uh, secondly, when you, when you are done with this webinar, please do spread the word about the work that's happening here at Peace Vigil by sharing the video of this um, webinar, but also uh, of our other videos and other programs. So I'm now going to uh, request Sami Dosani, my colleague, to please start the conversation with our esteemed speaker today, Nadima Jogi. Thank you so much, Shreen. Um, Nadima, could I also ask you to uh, turn on your camera and um, microphone? Um, hello, Nadima, how are you? Hi, Samia, I'm well, thank you. And yourself? Great, 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 great. So I thought um, we could begin the conversation if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you um, came to do what you're currently doing, maybe a little bit of your family, family background. And I know um, in South Africa, there's no one um, whose family background doesn't intersect with apartheid a little bit. Um, so maybe if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the multiracial, the multiracialism within your family background and how that's been a challenge as well. Um, okay, so I spoke to my parents this morning just to make sure the facts were right, because I think um, if I get them wrong, I'll be lynched across the family board. But um, yeah, it's fascinating because the racial classification of apartheid, which extended also up into um, southern Rhodesia under the um, racist uh, government of Ian Smith, of course, um, defined um, my family's life both, both sides. Um, so on my father's side, he has a, an, a father who, who hails from Gujarat. Um, a village in Gujarat and married a South African woman, Muslim woman, and and moved up to some well, what was then Southern Rhodesia. Um, I would assume partly to escape, um, you know, the repression of the government here, but but to settle and and live there. And my mother's family was much more impacted. Um, you know, uh, her great grandfather was Afrikaner. 
white Afrikaner and he couldn't marry. It was illegal to have an interracial marriage. And so he, you know, had to move to again, what was then Northern Rhodesia, so Zambia, in order to have a, to marry the, uh, my, my great grandmother who had Mauritian roots. So, so there was, you know, this melting pot and this mixing pot and then it was impacted um, by the politics of the day around race and race classification. Um, and the other interesting thing is, is how language, could, because of course, being in education, language is, is always interesting to me. Um, how the language issues sort of permeated through these families, um, how Afrikaans was banned essentially in, in my mother's family, uh, it was language of if you don't speak Afri Af um, Afrikaans, and, and how you know, multilingualism was a mainstay. We were just talking this morning to my mom about how my grandpa was, he, he could speak English, Afrikaans, French, Shona, Setswana, um, and, and fluently, you know, it, it's incredible how, um, how these things map also the geographical shifts um, just within the Southern African region with which I claim because I've lived in pretty much every country barring Lesotho and Swaziland, you know, so, um, yeah. And also because I, there were very few um, educational, or rather educational opportunities for people who are classified black or colored but better for people who are classified colored, which the majority of my family was an Asian. Um, and because of that, I um, grew up in a family of educators um, who hold education in very high esteem. And, um, and of course, this passed on to me. I mean, I vowed I'd never be like my parents. And then, of course, um, went into teaching like my parents. So, Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. Thank you for that history. From the personal, let's go back to the historic, if you don't mind, uh, Nadima. And just to say that when we talk about education, I think, especially for people who aren't in your field, the assumption is we're talking about, you know, kids in a classroom, you know, being taught reading, writing, and arithmetic um, by someone who sits at a board and, and sort of does it in a very traditional kind of stereotypical kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that's your understanding of education. So, so before, um, before that sort of colonial idea of education came, um, can you say anything about sort of knowledge systems or education systems that may have existed in Southern Africa prior to, um, to European colonialism? And I think, well, not a lot is, is known, but I think what we can definitely safely assume is that there, there was education. And I think the idea that there was none um, is something that's taken as, as, as a sort of a common knowledge of sorts. But, but what we have is we have a, a rich history um, of innovation and literacy and, and uh, thought and knowledge that's based um, on the continent um, and, and in Southern Africa. I, I, I know you've interviewed Rasigan um, Haraj before and, and he edited a book um, that he gifted me on innovation in Southern Africa and I was blown away about, you know, by the sort of mining innovations and the farming innovations. And so, of course, when there's that kind of knowledge on the continent, one can very safely assume that, um, that th this knowledge was passed on. So it, it would have not looked the way in which schooling looks. There's, there was no sort of formalized schooling, but absolutely they were, um, there was education being passed on um, in terms of cultural education and knowledge of the land and knowledge of how to survive and, and live and to flourish and trade. We have ancient trade routes um, here, you know, Mapungubwe and we have Great Zimbabwe and, and all of these things tell us that um, education and knowledge was, we are, we are rich in a history of it. So, so yes, I think the answer, um, you know, very much is of course we had systems of education, just they didn't look the way in which colonial uh, systems of education looked. Mm. Fantastic. I just want to, again, uh, reflect from the comments. Sandy Shell is saying, um, it's great that you have full screen, screen because uh, I have compromised hearing, so rely heavily on lip reading. We understand that, uh, Sandy, and we have uh, participants joining today who also have, who are completely uh, visually impaired. So we try to make this as accessible as possible. So uh, I just wanted to, um, Fast forward a little bit. I don't think we need to talk about the early colonial period necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but in the 19th century, so in the 1800s, I think we are already seeing the development of multiple, well, multiple South African societies, 
and therefore multiple sort of tracks, multiple educational systems to cater to the needs of each of those societies. Um, mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit, what, what would those, I mean, obviously later on those societies will be fully racialized and referred to as white and non-white or black, um, but then it gets even more categorized later. Um, so can you talk, what are the roots of what will become the apartheid system later? What are the origins of that in the 19th century? Why, why was that pursued? Why was it necessary to have different educational systems for different kinds of people? Mm. Okay, so I mean, I don't know if people know the history of South African colonization, but first, you know, we were colonized Dutch. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they brought their language and they, they, they weren't looking to settle in the Southern Africa. They, they were using it as a way station. Um, but then, you know, because of the wars and maybe in Europe, um, it was taken, the colony was taken over by the British in, in uh, 1815 or so. And it was with the British um, because this, the, the education under the Dutch wasn't uh, separated. It, it, in actual fact, the first school, first and second and third schools they set up were mixed schools. So they had no sort of um, grand ideological plan on separate anything, um, though they were colonists, of course. Um, but it was with the British that we start to see sort of the seeds of what's to become um, a segregationist policy. And, and these patterns of segregation are not simply along color lines, they're along class lines. With it comes, you know, uh, not just the setting up of schools, but uh, the setting up of paying secondary schools, for example. So a primary school, for example, would be uh, paid for by the state, but then once you got to secondary school in the, the 19th century, it was a, pay, a fee paying system. And so this, the, the, the segregation of education under the British um, starts to develop along color lines because they, they very early on um, uh, talked of native education and, and sort of the goals of native education as opposed to that of civilized uh, society and and these two things for the British were very different okay and um, as you know as early as 1902 the British set up a, a free compulsory state education system for white children for for white children the not for black children so black children couldn't attend the system the system wasn't set up for them it, uh, and it was paid for by the state. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think also in this time, we must remember what's happening in South Africa. Uh, we, the, the, the discovery of diamonds and then a bit later the discovery of gold meant that the, the whole fabric of South African society changed quite dramatically. Um, and there was huge sort of social upheaval and there was huge... Um, uh, the development of the industrialized working class and and we can't ignore that when we're looking at systems of education because um, the one thing we do know is that education systems as a system you mentioned the classroom with a teacher but that's embedded with an entire system that is um, uh, premised on supporting the needs of the society and so the society in that time you know the, the time between the discovery of of mineral, mineral wealth in the country um, heralded a, a huge urbanization project which meant influx of you know lots of people into the cities it um, and so what the British did was they 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 put down laws you know they fought the African the, the Boer the Boers and other communities um, in, in the South African war and declared the Union of South Africa in 1910 so so the British won that war essentially and once they won that war, um, it set in play, it set into play consequences which we're still dealing with today. So the Anglic Anglicization, if that's even a word, of, of the society um, began at that point. You know, the, the governor at the time, um, you know, wanted to strongly impose um, the, the character of, of British culture and language on the society. And so so then mandated, for example, English to be, the, um, to be the official language of state schools. And of course, there was a breakaway now because the Afrikaans, or the, rather the Dutch contingent, with, which in 20, 1924 became Afrikaans, but they broke away from that, you know, and they developed around a very nationalist um, um, ideology, uh, strong links to language and culture and nationalism. But for the main, 
the British imposition of English and English culture as, as, as normative in South Africa and as defining um, a state school system, um, free and compulsory for white children, um, laid the pattern for what was to be developed um, further down the road. And, and I think that that together with the other laws, for example, the, the Land Act of 1913, um, which moved 80% of our population onto like 14% of our land, um, influx and past laws, which, which restricted the movement of black people, but not white people. Um, all of this had a, a very real impact on the types of educational opportunities available to um, what was already a, a system of education that was arranged along class and, and color lines. Um, yeah. Could I, could I just ask, so, so um, there's two things that you mentioned that I just want you to explain in a little bit more um, mm -hmm. detail if you could. So one is this question about um, mines being, you know, diamonds being discovered, gold being discovered, and the the need, quote unquote, if we look at the, the policies, not just educational policies, all the policies from the British government at that time, it was largely about trying to create a workforce. I, I, I don't know where to put the quote. This all sounds so, so funny <laughs> to talk about creating a workforce from people, right? So how do you force people to become um, ideally slaves? Um, but when slave, I mean, this is now, then you're going back to the 19th century, but when slavery was abolished, um, different kinds of cheap labor was necessary, especially for the gold mines and the diamond mines and so on. So um, how does education come into that? And also if you could explain a little bit more um, for our international listeners about what the, the past laws entailed, what specifically that meant. Um, okay, so, so, you know, slavery was abolished um, and then it was abolished across all the colonies. And so in South Africa, there were roughly about 35,000 slaves were, were released and, and, and these were released from bondage. And, and these people, um, they went into different, you know, different places, but some of them landed up in, in earth centers. Um, and in the urbanization, um, you know, first, the, the sort of the first wave of industrialized um, labor that came into the cities with the, with the mines, but then, this, you know, the, the manufacturing, the second, secondary industrialization that happened, um, as well as the past law that forced people off the land, because what, what, the, part of, uh, what the British government did was Im, impose a, a tax um, for the, for the, uh, the, the land that they put black people on and in order, you know, to make them wage labor. So in order for them to be able to pay the tax, they needed to earn a wage. Um, so it was one of the ways in which um, they, they forced people into labor. Um, and so, so the, the tax laws forced people off the land and into the urban areas. And, um, you know, they, they, they were then uh, forced into, into earning a wage. So then, you know, some of the writing of the time uh, in talking about um, sp specifically later on Bunty education, um, because up until Bunty education, which is 1955, and 1953 and implemented in 1955, up until then, there was no compulsory education for African, black African children. Now, I mentioned that in as early as 1904, there was, uh, uh, the state had introduced it for white children. So, you know, there was this, this huge amount of um, time that happened in which black African children did not get um, any kind of education unless it was some form of uh, elite and they got some missionary schooling, but the missionary school system really couldn't uh, accommodate but a fraction of the, the black population. Um, and they were also heavily underfunded, et cetera, et cetera. So the, mission, the missionary schools that were in the country really didn't provide enough education for the black population and um so there was this notion of social unrest you know the using of edu when you read some of the the literature from the time it's it's this constant idea that education can be used to quell social unrest can be used to deal with civic disobedience and and these kind of notions that we're going to have this mob of black people in the cities that are going to the crime rates will go up etc etc and and so in order to prevent all of this we need to 
um, put them in school, basically. We need to um, educate them to only a certain level, though, because we, if we go beyond that level, they will now aspire to a different place in society to which they cannot possibly um, uh, attain. So, so that's the sort of rhetoric around, um, around that. But then the past laws came in, and the past laws um, did a few things. So the past laws basically... You uh, so under the British rule, um, they they identified land upon which black people could live, and then you were only allowed into um, urban areas and other areas of the country um, if you had a pass, if you had some form of uh, um, identification that allowed you, and and generally this was to work. Okay, so you you would. Um, obtain this pass in order to work um, and but you were not allowed for example if you're a man you were not allowed to bring your family they had to stay behind and because of this they were able to keep wages low so you know employers would would say I don't have to pay you a wage for a family I just pay a wage as a single man because your family is being fed and supported by subsistence farming and, and other such things that back um, home and um, and and so this and other ways, they were able to keep wages very low um, and, and, and sort of build this huge corpus of, of, of cheap labor for the mines and for the farms um, that allowed South Africa to go through its enormic, enormous economic growth uh, in that period before World War II. So it was, um, it was a whole series of, of, of laws that um, worked together, really, so the segregationist years just before apartheid just before the National Party came in in 1948, that had already stratified the society, had already um, uh, um, created this, this class of workers, laborers, cheap labor, um, mm. that had to be, that required semi-skills. Semi you know, it did, the, the mining and, the, and the, the farming, particularly when the manufacturing sector started to um, flourish, all of this required um, people to receive some sort of education. Um, but then things like the, jo the color bar, the, the job color bar, uh, those laws were also passed in the 20s, where, where certain job, job reservation laws, where certain jobs, um, the more skilled jobs or the higher management jobs, those were reserved for white people, and um, uh, no, it didn't matter your level of education. Uh, you, if you were a black person, you could not uh, get any of those jobs. Yeah. Mm. So it's all... Um bit complicated. I just want to reflect that um, Sandy has written a very nice comment. I'll let, I'll let everyone read it at their own uh, pace, but just about um, how, how this may have happened in the Eastern Cape specifically in the 1860s. Um, I just want to um, highlight a couple of things from what you've said, um, Nadima, which is, which is that we have, so in the, in, after the Boer War, so after the, the 1910 to 1920 period, we have emerging a system or systems of education which are quite different for different kinds of people. And it's not just what will become black and white. It is, there is one sort of an elite, let's say British oriented education. Um, you know, so that's, that's the traditional colonial view of education that it is for the elites that exists and that is continuing. There is another kind of education which we can describe as something like a vocational training, but like a higher end vocational training, which is becoming more and more common for um, Dutch speaking or Afrikaner people who are also white to access that system of education. Then you have another system of education, which you've described, which is to give black people, especially African people, especially who are being displaced from their land, um, the skills that they need to go into the mining sector specifically. Um, mm. Does that is is there any is there a fourth track in that in that in that piece at this point? I know there will be other tracks when we get it post nineteen forty eight, but is is that pretty much it pre nineteen forty eight? No, I mean you know there were um, the very few missionary education mission education missionary education in schools, and um, um, did did give schooling very good schooling um uh, schooling that um to a very small minority of of what become the african elite you know and allows them to, to access sort of higher education 
and then tertiary education. But this is such a small fraction of the black population. So we then see a stratification along class lines of the black population too. And I think, you know, we'd be remiss to not um, take that into consideration, particularly when, you know, the ANC was, was formed in response to the Land Act, okay, so it, it wasn't the ANC, it wasn't initially called the ANC, it was the National, I'm not too sure exactly of what it was before that it became the ANC, but it was formed in response and in resistance to the Land Act of, of 1913, and, and so in those kind of political organizations, um, educated black elite who go through the, the, the tiny crack that's allowed them um, educationally in the country start to filter in. So, you know, by the time the 1930s, 1940s, um, 1950s come along, you've got the likes of Sobukwe and Tambo and Mandela who've gone through that tiny crack that allows them. There we go. Thank you, in the Native National Congress. That's what it is. It allows them um, access to, to, to higher education and, and creates an elite um, which, which 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 is a fraction compared to the white population perhaps but but an elite nonetheless so even within the the hard categories of racialization the stratification mm. fantastic and, and how does that change so uh, let me, i mean maybe before i ask my next question let me just say that in addition to ember's comment we have uh, aziz professor aziz Chaudhry's comment comment which is talking about parallels between Victoria and canada and new zealand uh, aziz let me just say that next week at precisely this time we will be interviewing um, Professor Rasigan Maharaj and also an activist, a native activist from the US who's with the Indigenous Environmental Network. Her name is Vineshi. And we'll be talking about parallels um, between India, South Africa, and the US. So maybe not those countries, um, but hopefully we can include Canada and New Zealand later. Um, hi, especially to your cat in the background, Nadima, looking very cute. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. Keeps it interesting. Um, so, so does this change? So I think that's very important to say that there is a space for elite black education. Um, and that is very much a parallel with the Indian um, situation at this time as well, um, with the Native National Congress perhaps echo echoing the Indian Congress, um, which was established by the British at around the same time. Um, but uh, so once we move to the post-1948 era, so I'm talking about the period, period between, say, 48 and 76, because we'll talk about Soweto in a second. Um, so, does this change? I mean, it feels like it changes. For someone who was who studied this in books, I didn't live here, obviously, at that time. Um, but I, you know, when I when I look yeah. at the apartheid stuff, it feels like it feels like it's far more complicated than what we're describing. So, how does it change, sort of post nineteen forty eight? Um. So, I I mean, I think because my focus has always been education, and I and I do I, I read the historical record as a matter of framing my my thinking around education and and trying to understand what we have now so so i mean i think the the first thing that strikes me is that um apartheid doesn't introduce segregationist policies it deepens it and i you know so it takes for example the 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 the, the 1913 land act and 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 entrenches it in law and it becomes sort of this Bantustan homelands um uh, concept um, that they that they then put into law it becomes a legal legal legalistic um, entrenched enforced segregation even more so than it was prior to that um, I think then also the big thing for me um, is is the introduction of of bounty education for black South Africans or they weren't considered South African black children and then, uh, you know, a separate education system um, for white children, which was um, Christian national education. And, and, and I think we need to be very clear here, both of these systems were, were fatally flawed because they were in, you know, they were in, in, encased in an ideology of racial um, discrimination and, 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 and super white superior, uh, supremacy. And, and, and so both were really flawed conceptions of education and both very, problematic but the quality um, of provisioning education provisioning for white students um, was vastly superior to that of black students black children um, and then layer upon on top of that a racial categorization a racial grid that now divides the society into four 
um, categories of race, um, which are quite arbitrary, really. I mean, I know this from my own family, but of course I know this from, from reading, um, is, is that you know, your, your, your racial category um, could be determined by your, you know, what you physically look at, even though, but then also, you know, if that wasn't comprehensive enough, then, you know, it, they had gradations of sort of trying to decide how much of something you were. And, and it could change. Um, these things <laughs> um, were, were bizarre. So, so, and then that determined everything. It determined where you could live. It determined what schools you could go to. It determined who you could marry. It determined um, your, your life chances in a very real way. Um, and, and with education, I think, so Bunty education is an interesting thing for me because, um, you know, it wasn't resisted by a lot of people. It, so, so Bunty education came in um, and it, what it did was enable state provisioning for black children. Um, and it was the first time ever in the history of South Africa that the uh, schooling was made available to black people on the scale, at the scale, okay? And while we can say, you know, there was definitely resistance to it, of course, and then, you know, they started the, um, the ANC actually led the resistance to, to this and they, they, they put forward a, a program of alternative education that actually lasted a few years. But then, you know, there was strong coercive straight state re, uh, revolution. There was, um, and, and, and the push of, of the apartheid ideology. But I don't think we can really explain, you know, Bantu education just as state repression and, and ideology. I think there has to be some kind of um, reckoning with the fact that there was, um, broader social uh, acceptance of, of Bantu education on some level um, because the resistance to it in, in all reality failed. It, it really did. By the 1960s, you know, I, I mean, there was almost no, and because of the repression, um, there was almost no resistance allowed. But, but there's also the, the sense that, you know, it, it, and what underpinned Bantu education was a material reality of providing school. And I'm at, personally, I think that's a lesson for all of us. You know, the, the material reality of something um, goes a long way in to, to, um, to, to giving legitimacy to something. Um, and I think that it, it still remains that Bantu education is racist and discriminatory and, and hugely um, problematic. But, uh, you know, for a lot of people, I think that that part of it uh, was made more palatable by the fact that we actually have schooling. Um, yeah, but that's a conversation we don't often have actually. Um, yeah. No, fantastic. Mm. It's, it's an interesting question and it brings us to, um, you know, to another part of the discussion, which is that by the 1970s, we have, um, okay. we have a situation where everyone and especially black communities feel that um, feel that education is, a, I mean, this language didn't exist yet, um, but the, the, the feeling that education was a human right was, um, or it wasn't mainstream, uh, was, was definitely in the air. And so you had, um, you had people protesting for better schools and you had big protests, student protests in Soweto, which were at least partly or largely around the issue of language. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that, that period in history? Uh, sorry, uh, around the um, Soweto uprisings, you're talking around about. Soweto, I mean, because when, when it's taught, you know, even if you go to the apartheid muse museum and you look at the exhibits to do the, with the Soweto uprising, they basically say that the students were protesting to have act to be taught in English, um, which seems, given the history that we've gone over, it seems like it's at least not the whole story. Um, so I don't know. Mm. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, again, to contextualize 1976, um, in the early 1970s, starting with the, well, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not a historian of any measure, but um, I did have to do history. Um, um, you know, there were the, the, the Durban, if I can vaguely remember, the Durban uh, port rights, or the, there were some, some strikes in Durban, and, and the repression of the 1960s and the, the clampdown on the, um, the, the resistance to apartheid was very strong, but coming into the 1970s, 
um, and there are most pe many people who know a lot more about this, um, you know, the, the, the atmosphere in the country started to change. Uh, it started to shift. And by the time 1976 came around, in terms of education, um, the reality was, was that um, for a, a black African child, what you were getting was um, eight years of mother tongue education because the apartheid government believed in mother tongue education um, along cultural lines, right? So, um, and, and then for the English and Afrikaans or the English or Afrikaans or both speaking child, what that morphed into was dual medium schooling. But for the black African child, um, they had what started off as eight years of mother tongue schooling um, in the language, and then um, a, a schooling that with it, where one subject had to be taught in English, one subject had to be taught in Afrikaans, and the rest in their own language with the languages as subjects. But then in 1976, it actually happened a few years before it, but the, the, the enforcement of it happened in 1976, where some, some new newbie um, cleric or clerk came into the department and said, starting from now, uh, mathematics will be taught in, in Afrikaans. And so, you know, apartheid was linked to, to um, Afrikaans. It, it, these things are, are tightly linked in people's minds and in reality. But also the, the notion of the apartheid government putting in a policy of mother tongue education, which educationally is sound, it, it actually makes sense and it's, it's, it's a good policy, um, which was supported quite coincidentally by a 1953 UNESCO um, declaration of the, the use of the vernacular in education. And, you know, so it was, it, it, the apartheid government um, used this as justification for the policies which we know was not in line with UNESCO's um, idea around uh, um, advocating for this, but rather part of the divide and rule strategy that the apartheid government had. And people understanding the ideology of apartheid um, when implementing a mother tongue policy was not doing so for educationally sound reasons, but rather doing so um, for their, their policy of separateness. So, so there was an inherent, there, there was, what had built up was an inherent suspicion of mother tongue education, a, a complete aversion to Afrikaans. And so um, really what that left black South Africans was English in terms of language. And so when some person comes and says, you know, you have to now learn something like mathematics in, um, in a language of the oppressor, um, a language most teachers couldn't teach in, in a language most children couldn't learn in, um, then, you know, this was, we're boycotting school. And of course it was met with uh, direct force and children died. Yeah. Um, lots of children died, yeah. I think this is a good point to just take a take a step back and tell us a little bit about like how many languages are spoken in South Africa um, and how many of those languages are people taught in today and so on. I think it would be useful for some of our listeners to hear hear those kind of statistics. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, officially today we have eleven. Um, I, I think eleven that have the same status supposedly in our well in law. They have the same, so there are official languages, 11. Um, under apartheid, there was only uh, two, English and Afrikaans, right? The African languages were not recognized as official languages. Um, in terms of what people speak, because I think we need to make these distinctions because it will speak to the continuities of, of inequality that have continued from, like I said, night when, when Governor Milner, you know, wanted to enforce English as a as state language, language for state schools back after the, the anglo boer War. So, I mean, so, so what people speak is not just 11 languages. There are varieties, there are dialects, there are funny laws, there are a whole range of languaging that people engage in that um, cross the boundaries of what we call standard language. And I think that's really important for education. For education, we have to recognize that we can't rely on a bounded idea of language, otherwise we're going to start excluding people. I think, I think that's the big 
problem with all of this. But, okay, but if we're talking about official languages, um, under apartheid there were two, and under, in post-apartheid we have 11, which includes sign language, by the way. So, yeah, that's, Fantastic. that's the language. But but just realistically yeah. speaking, you know, if I am, um, I don't know what's a good, good example. So I know that if I am in Johannesburg, for example, and my tongue is, is uh, Sesotho, um, I probably can't be taught in that. I'll probably be taught either in English, Afrikaans, or Isizuli. Is that correct? Yeah, so the post apartheid um, language in education arrangements have allow or, or rather just the official status of languages it means that there's 11 official languages in the country but then there are official languages um, and so um, each province has a, a a set of languages uh, so in my province where i live it's english afrikaans and isikosa and um, you know so depending on where you are in the country your province will have an arrangement of languages that are considered official provincial languages um, but in the country as a whole um, there are 11, but then again, I, you know, I must make the distinction that in reality, uh, I'm much more than that. And, and, and Koli, sorry, uh, my colleague from Prisa and friend Koli is, is mentioning that children learn in the home language until grade three. Yes. So, so in our current arrangement, post-apartheid arrangement, children supposedly learn through their home language until grade three. Um, so the first three grades, grade one, two, and three, and then at grade four, there is a, an abrupt shift to English as a medium or Afrikaans, depending on which school they go to. So um, African languages are not taught beyond grade three in yeah. South Africa today. Yeah, um, before we go further, so now we're sort of moving into the present. Um, before we continue that discussion on the present, um, I just want to address a couple of things that have come up in the chat. Um, Aradi mm. uh, asks about um, the people who could get, so historically the people who could get uh, a good education who were black, um, were they sort of elites? Um, and I think the short answer is in most cases, but I don't know if you want to say anything more to that. Sorry, to say anything more to... Well, you know, for example, um, Adiba and, and Bito and some of the people who we've talked about who were able to access this um, better better black education um mm. as far as i know they were all coming from sort of an elite class of some kind or another is that is that correct um i i don't know if i can comment on that i mean i i think to a certain extent so i suppose um i i actually don't want to comment on that because i i most likely will be wrong but i mean you know at that point Fort Hare was already set up so there was a it was it was a black university for black people um, and so they were they were there wasn't there were avenues that people could attain high educational um, uh, education they could get it um, and I'm, I'm I don't I don't think you're I, I'm not sure of the selection process I don't know I mean I assume geography was part of that I assume your ability to um, for your family to be able to send you to those places i'm not i'm actually not even sure yeah i'm not how sure how people yeah. yeah i'm not sure myself no, the, the specific biographies of people i know who, who you know who were able to get that education so people like um becky people like um, mandela they were from very elite um backgrounds within their tribal affiliation as far as I know, but I only know a couple of stories. So there may, I'm sure there's lots of stories of people who don't necessarily have that as well. Um, but something- And I remember Neville, yeah, Neville Alexander, I mean, he got a bursary to UCT um, and, and, you know, he, he came from Craddock, which is just up the road from where I live. And uh, he um, had to, move, well, got into UCT, had to move to Cape Town and then got the opportunity to do his PhD in Germany. So, I mean, they were, um, oh, Paulie's saying she thinks the people who converted to Christianity had access to mission schools. I mean, I'm pretty sure that was a big one. Uh, you know, religion would guide some of that. Yeah. I, I mean, I do think um, prior to prior to apartheid, prior to that, um, I mean, I think there's a lot more. I, I, I say this with reservation because I actually don't know. It's just sort of in my head. 
um, there was a lot more opportunity uh, because of the kind of patronization of, a, of the British system. You know, they were moving towards an integration of sorts, even though it was segregationist. And I think of Zimbabwe when I, when I say this, because Zimbabwe, um, I, I, I was schooled in Zimbabwe, and, and that system very much was, um, you know, a, a, a quite a heavily um, racialized patronization of black people. So, you know, if you proved yourself, then you were given the opportunity, but, but you, you know, you, they, you had to jump through hoops and, and they had to be, like Paulie says, they had, you had to be Catholic, you had to be all these kind of things first, and then the sort of path was laid out for you. But um, there are very few people could access it because you had to tick the boxes uh, if you were black or colored or Indian. Yeah. Fantastic. And Ram Murthy has a couple of questions that I just want to flag before we go further. Um, his first question is, what did the apartheid government do to keep imposing an educational and cultural hegemony over blacks? Uh, his second question is, you mentioned four distinct categories of education. Um, did they have separate curricula for all of them? Or was there a cur separate curricula for white elite or a separate curricula for vocational education? Did you want to address uh, either of those questions? Um, the Bunty education, so, so the mission schools that happened that were in effect for black children before apartheid. So, you know, for a long time, the, the missionary education tradition held huge influence over the, the black African elite, you know, it, and, and this is where we talk about the Mandela's and the, the people who go through that system. But their legitimacy, they were coming at a huge sort of challenge in terms of their claims to knowledge and, and, and just the ability to um, uh, uh, give education for young black students. So, um, with the introduction of Bantu education, um, the mission schools were dissolved. They were taken away, and uh, children were were then into the system. And and then, of course, you know, apartheid um, had to find a way to. Uh, to, to, to make its ideology uh, more palatable, okay? And so, so this is what I mean when I say, um, you know, the discussion about Bantu education is not so simple. It, you know, it's not just the state forced it through, it became law, and so then it was that. You know, people, uh, like I said, the material reality of, of school provisioning, where there had been none before it, um, is quite powerful, coupled together with, um, you know, this understanding that people realize, you know, very quickly, there's something very wrong with this education. But, um, you know, there weren't very many avenues for alternatives, so there were alternatives. Um, and also because, like I said, it's kind of this idea that, you know, we didn't have it, and now we have it. And so the, the ideological underpinnings of Bantu education were able to take root um, not simply because of repression and, and ideology, but because of, of you know, um, I don't want to say buy in it, it's such a negative connotation, but yeah, so uh, mm, an acquiescence of sorts from people. Um, it's as to the different, yeah, it's difficult. As to the syllabi, yes, they were, they were definitely different syllabi for curricula, for uh, the different um, education systems. Um, uh, you know, so uh, hewers of wood and drawers of water. So black children were to be taught needlework and domestic labor and um, not too much maths and not too much literacy um, uh, because they didn't need it. You don't need to read and write at a high level. You don't need to do complex arithmetic. You do need to learn English and Afrikaans because if your boss talks to you in English and Afrikaans, you should be able to understand and respond. Um, so it was geared very much towards their role in society as labor, um, you know, uh, manual labor more than anything. Um, and then of course, uh, the pathway for white students was, was a lot more academic and colored students and Asian students eventually, or rather colored eventually and Asian students was a lot more academic um, and, you know, laid the pathway through to university and yeah. the higher echelons of the job market, yes. Yeah, 
So I just want to, um, for our international listeners, I just want to um, try and clarify a few things. So I, I, in the one context, we're talking about an apartheid regime, which is imposing these structures in a very artificial way across the whole society. And therefore there's resistance, even if some of the policies may make some sense, you know, like for example, native language education and so on, we've discussed and we will discuss later on as a very good policy. Um, so that may have been a policy that made some sense, but it, within the structure of a top-down Afrikaner imposition of these structures, often it gets resisted. So I think that's one point to bring up. The second point, and the term that you've used that I think uh, people won't be familiar with, is this term Bantu education. So, so in, in South Africa, a majority of people come from a number of tribes which have migrated about a thousand years ago, less than a thousand years ago, um, from West and Central Africa, which are called the Bantu speaking peoples. Their languages are Bantu speaking, although they have been influenced by Southern African languages as well, especially um, through the certain click sounds that don't exist anywhere else in the world that exist only here, for example. So just to point out that when they say Bantu education, it's actually an education, I guess it's for all Africans. I guess, I guess Khoisan people and so on probably had to deal with that as well. Yeah. Um, and then, and now, now we're talking about in the apartheid era, we're also talking about slightly um, professionalized blacks because everyone needs doctors, everyone needs teachers. And those, yeah. um, your um, Asian, your um, Indian, your Chinese uh, people sort of take that role. That, is that correct? Um, no, they, I mean, the, the small, the small um, strata of elite, a uh, black elite, um, was I, I read something. Uh, I was reading. I, I was reading something about um, the reports of the time, and it, it one of them mentioned how you know it was felt that those because the, the the vision for apartheid was that you know culturally we were separate and different, <laughs> but in, in reality, of course, it was separate and unequal. Um, and and the, the black people um, would flourish and be happy, you know, just among themselves with their own language and their own culture. And therefore they would need their own doctors, their own teachers, their own professionals. Um, and so, you know, that little sliver of, of the community that was able to attain these educational um, things. I mean, that was that was to serve that community, and that was their rightful place. And and I think um, it's 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 so um, bizarre to even imagine this kind of thinking, especially this kind of scale. Um, but but this is indeed there was that, and then there was a forced sort of, you know, it, it was sort of this this wonderful idea of wonderful this this idea idyllic idea of secrets you know but but um in reality what it took to create it was was ridiculous amounts of repression and inhumanity um which compromised you know their very own humanity so so it was this very bizarre contradictory um notion so so it's not that people were stopped from getting an education just it wasn't allowed you know we can't have too many of them getting this kind of education because that would just upset the whole system okay and then they'd wanting to come live here by us and they'd wanting to go to no we can't we can't have that yeah. they have their place and um it is less than it's our job to um remind them of their place and to create that place for them mm -hmm. and and so you know they did this on a grand scale yeah yeah so we get now to 1994, and um, this is, you know, I think we've described, I think we've done a good job of describing the sort of arbitrariness and the nonsensicalness of this whole system. Uh, but in 1994, um, you know, we have parties in the streets, we have an election, the first free election involving um, every, well, involving almost everyone or everyone above 18 um, could, could vote theoretically. I, I know there were issues with that election, but compared to the elections before, it was the, the, the freest election. Um, you have the ANC coming to power with huge majorities. Um, so what was the thinking, um, you know, of the, the incoming government about how to, how to address these at that time? How did it think it could, it could undo? Because it's a mess. Uh, how, how, did, how did it plan to undo the mess? Um, 
Um, so I'm going to talk, you know, so the 1976 happened. So there was this huge um, pushback against the government and its policies. And of course, it's now embedded within a, a broader um, struggle against uh, the hold of apartheid. Um, it's not just an educational struggle. Um, education is, is a terrain of struggle against apartheid for a democratic South Africa. And this continues on. But, but I think educationally, what we have to grapple with is that because the, 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 the principle of mother tongue education holds true, okay, it, it's a solid principle of education. And um, I mean, if we, we use the only metric we really have, which is the metric pass rate, which is a school leaving examination pass rate of the time. And, you know, 20 years of eight years of mother tongue education sets a solid firm uh, foundation, even in the context of uh, an impoverished curriculum, okay? But um, given that, uh, we look at metric pass rates and we find it 25. And then they decline quite steadily until about 1979. And, and, and this coincides with a reduction, the response of the apartheid government to the, the uprising was to reduce mother tongue education because there was a, a real perceived um, suspicion around mother tongue education because people said, well, you don't want us, you're extending mother tongue education because you don't want us to access English and therefore you don't want us to access knowledge, you know, the, the conflation of English and knowledge. Um, and so when the apartheid government increased mother tongue and then moved to Afrikaans, the pushback was, you can't, you need to reduce it. So they did, they reduced it to four years um, and, and we see a steady decline because what happens practically in a classroom is that after eight years of mother tongue education with, with fairly adequate teaching of English and Afrikaans as a subject, what it means is that you have epistemological access to text um, that you, you start to undermine when you reduce the, the, the time spent with mother tongue education. So texts, um, uh, sorry, uh, matric pass rates then start to decline and uh, we enter the 1980s and there's huge social upheaval, there's state of emergence, um, you know, the rise of people's education, which is fantastic, but is not put into policy in the end. People, people's education is false, doesn't even see policy actually. Um, and in 1994, you know, uh, the, the, the segregationist and separatist apartheid government you know, what was inherited were sort of 10 departments of education, um, you know, along with, you know, four national, it was this crazy, um, huge amounts of, of, of um, administrative mess. And so what happened was they, they consolidated and they, they made one department of education or a department for, for prime and then for, and one for higher primary and senior and then one for higher. They took away the multiple curricula and they put, they implemented one curricula for all children in South Africa. So, so when you look at this on the surface, you're saying, okay, this is, this is progress, this is good. Um, we don't differentiate curricula according to race. We don't, uh, you know, it's, it's a, just a complete um, abrupt, um, change from what came before. You know, the, the school decisions on schooling are uh, decentralized down to parents and teachers um, and uh, national doesn't make those kind of on the ground decisions for schooling communities. So this is all very nice and it sounds very nice and it looks very nice on paper. But of course, the spatial realities of apartheid remain and um, the under-resourceness. I mean, they, they do try and they attempt to refigure the budgets and, and um, deal with the huge discrepancy between uh, what, are, what are called former white schools, ex-model C schools, um, state schools, and, and black schools, township schools and rural schools. They, they put in a quintile system, which is supposed to uh, redress the imbalance in, in um, finances, in finances for the schools. But actually, in the end, nothing fundamentally changes in the sense that um, uh, we still have a, a system <laughs> that is stratified along class and color, much like 
it was um, my track was higher. And um, the language question, which is which is what I am interested in and involved in, the language issues have not changed. So um, prior ninety four and post ninety four, children who speak English and Afrikaans in our country um, have an uninterrupted education in the mother tongue from grade R to university. It's uninterrupted and it is uh, that it's provided for. Okay, they have books, they have textbooks, they have resources, they have teachers trained. African language speaking children have three years, if that, in a supposed mother tongue, because we got it, I mean, these things are very problematic. And then these are switched to English or Afrikaans and, and our matric, our school leaving examinations are still written in English or Afrikaans. There are some moves, some very slight moves to try and um, disrupt this, um, but, but on the whole and for the majority, this truth remains. And for me, I think the issue of a medium of instruction is a continuity that has continued through history and, and is one of the major sources of inequality in our system, for my opinion is that it remains one of the, the, the reasons why inequality persists. Apart from, of course, the material reasons, the fact that we, you know, our macroeconomic policy is such that it is, all those other things granted. Educationally, for me, the, 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 the medium of instruction um, mm -hmm. entrenches an inequality of access and, um, yeah. Mm. So, uh, uh, if I were, I mean, if I can play devil's advocate for a minute, um, I would say something like, you know, um, if you look at the best school systems around the world, they tend to have, you know, if you look at, at countries like France or, or certainly the U.S., given its colonial history, but, um, you know, even France and Germany, there was no French, universal French speaking policy when France started implementing schools. People spoke different languages, people spoke different dialects. And in fact, that uniformity, the, the sort of forcing of a certain kind of language down people's throats, if you like, um, was one of the things that created, um, you know, created not just um, the quality of French education. I mean, so if I was if I was a Eurocentric person, I would say, look at how good education is in France or whatever. But you get my point. My point being that why should South Africa be have um, what is what is important about the medium of instruction, especially at a young age, that we need to prioritize that. Okay, now listen, under very specific conditions, any child can learn in any language, but it, it requires specific conditions. It requires access, it requires role models, it requires resources. Um, and, but in our country, um, the majority of our children don't have access to those conditions. And so therefore asking them to learn in a language that they don't have access to in any meaningful way, nor is there any support in any meaningful way, um, nor are our teachers equipped in any meaningful way, nor are our schools equipped in any meaningful way, then what you've done is in the context of those um, severe deprivations, the language policy then plays an even um, more debilitating role. It becomes even harder now for children to, to access education. Um, so, 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 so I, I mean, at no point would I ever say that language is a silver bullet, that if we fix language, we're going to fix the education. I absolutely am not saying that. I'm saying that in terms of the inequality of educational attainment, uh, the language issue, the medium issue, given the context on the ground of vast inequality and historical disadvantage um, that goes, that is so multifaceted, you know, it's not one thing. Um, it's, it's, it's down to an expectation of a child. You know, what do we expect children to do? And there's this very real under expectation of black children and um, coupled with the lack of sort of community and school resources for literacy, for example, um, to sort of role models who, who kind of show that this is something that um, we should want to do. We should want to excel in school. And uh, all of these things and more um, create an environment with which you now put in a foreign language for some children and, and what is a second, third, fourth language for other children and you teach through that. Um, you then put um, you put 
uh, you put that goal of education even further away from a child. Um, it's an additional burden on top of all the other burdens that the society has created um, through vast inequality. And, and um, you know, if we were to shift and we were to give African language speaking children the same thing we give my child who grew up in an English household who has who, who doesn't even you know he he just expects to be to go to school and to understand it's something that's not even questioned yet the vast majority in our of children in our country can't have that expectation they go to school and they they well they, they don't really understand meaningfully um grasp what is going on in, in in the class and then we want to wonder why you know there's there's a huge dropout rate we have a massive dropout rate in our school system you know we've got um it, it's 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 just unfathomable that this has been allowed to continue for so long and it's something that like i said has a historical root um that we we know this this is not a new issue it's not a novel idea i'm not saying anything that hasn't been said a hundred times before by other people much more important than i um but it is a solid reality of our children and our schools thanks there's a couple of things um that i just want to again sort of take take a a, a, a bigger picture view and just remind our especially um so our, our international listeners can maybe learn a little bit more um when we talk mm -hmm. about the speciality of apartheid or, or the the so we touched on this a little bit with the past laws that there are places where black people are just not allowed to go. We're just, mm -hmm. we're not allowed to go prior to 1994. Now after 1994, okay, you can come to the white neighborhood, but you still, you might still be harassed by the police. Um, and also like, what business do you have? It's not your neighborhood. You live in a, in a, what we call a township near the city um, that you were forced to live in. And that's the only land that you had access to. So, um, that spatial nature of apartheid is still something that we, you know, when we talk about urban uh, planning in South Africa in general, you can't ignore mm -hmm. which were the white districts, which were the the, the mm -hmm. non -white districts. Um, it's very it's very obvious. Uh, Marjorie is asking um, a couple of questions to do with inequalities within um, within black communities. I think we've addressed some of that. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, educational inequalities and social inequalities are linked. And absolutely, social inequalities must still be existing. Just to, to let you know, when we do measures of inequality, which are mostly economic measures of inequality, South Africa is number one or number two. I mean, it has been for the last many, many years. So um, for people who don't know, that, um, you know, that's, that's certainly the case. Um, there are questions coming from Kanyisa about, um, you know, that in the past um, there was a class of um, Africans who got better education, you know, is there a lesson to be learned there, I guess is her question. Um, um, or Lisa is, is making the comment that um, language is super important because it's, it's about making meaning. And, and if children uh, are taught in a medium of instruction they can't really understand, they may be able to parrot what they hear, but they're not really learning. I think that's a, a huge, um, huge important point. Aradita makes the point that mother tongue education is being um, recognized even by the World Bank, correct? Um, yeah, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there in terms of stuff from the chat box. Um, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess sort of if we, you know, getting to today, there's a narrative and I don't know how true it is. Or did you want to reply to anything in the chat box before, um, before I, I ask my next question? No? No. Um, so there's a narrative around education today in South Africa, and, and I, I know it's wrong, but I want you to tell me how it's wrong. <laughs> the narrative is, is something like, you know, um, prior to some point, I don't know what the point is, 1994, 2010, some change in the education policy that has happened in the last 10, 20 years, there seems to have been a, a point when the school system is just going down. And I know myself as someone who, who taught um, just one term, I taught it at, at Swami University of, Te of Technology. But there seems to be pressure um, on professors and on educators to sort of have a certain pass rate to sort of make sure that things happen in a certain way and so on. So some of that is probably real, but some of it is also probably imagined. Um, and I, I think there's a, a sense that the quality of education is, is decreasing from a low base. Do you think there's, I mean, to what extent is that true? To what extent is that not true? And if it is true, um, 
what do you see as, as some of the solutions, including um, the solution in terms of language? Um, so I'm just reading Aziz's point and what you just asked um, coincides with what Aziz is asking, which is, you know, what is the relationship between the ongoing evolution of the of racial capitalism, education and language today? And um, okay, so I think I think it's important to understand that when South Africa came into the global community back or joined the global community um, after 94, it coincided with a, a, um, a global sort of restructuring on neoliberal, it didn't start then, but it joined a, a world that had uh, sort of globalized in a sense and, and restructured around um, what the developmental regimes, which in Southern Africa followed, um, very neoliberal structure. You, I mean, you as an, you would know uh, more about this. But but essentially, um, Southern Africa had had were, were forced in one way or another to to restructure their economies. And so South Africa came into the de democratic uh, 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 new South Africa, new South Africa, and um, they their developmental goals were were initially around the reconstruction the RDP reconstruction and development program. Okay, which at the heart of it had issues of equity and redress and, um, you know, social development as its goals. You know, we need to build people houses, we need to create, um, you know, uh, jobs for people, we, and we need to uplift those who have been historically and currently um, pushed down. Okay, um, but then, of course, um, what happened was a, a kind of very what seems like an easy capitulation to, to a different path. Um, so the, the macroeconomic um, uh, framework, which South Africa chose, the ANC-led government chose to follow, was um, actually GEAR, you know, which was, was a neoliberal set of policies centered around reducing social spending and fiscal blah, blah, and, you know, kind of cutting, um, budgets that were to do with um, social upliftment of people and then more to do with um, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, streamlining South Africa's economics into uh, market-driven global, globalization, global things. Okay, so I'm not an economist, I'm going to say all the wrong words, but that, that essentially, that shift um, means our macroeconomic, oh, sorry, our macroeconomic framework was really at odds with what our democratic state said it wanted, right? So how can we uh, redress after cut spending on social, social things like health and education and you know housing? Like how, how does this these two things? How do we square this 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 thing? And 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 to be honest with you, the rhetoric of democracy had happened. I mean, apartheid was a, a, a struggle of epic proportions, and and you couldn't talk about um, not redressing apartheid and not dealing with that legacy. Um, but then we had this macroeconomic uh, framework who, that, you know, education didn't escape. We didn't escape it in education. Um, and so, so, so many things happened. I, I, mean, I don't actually know how to answer this question properly and succinctly, but I, th I think um, we have to understand that our education reform has in a globalized world doesn't happen only within a nation state. We are now connected to the world. And the global education reform is, is something that's happening across the world. And it's happening in very particular ways. And it's happening in the, in the context of uh, macroeconomic policies that are aligned to very new ideals. So, so we can, um, so if I take, for example, Claudia and I are involved in curriculum development and teacher education at university level. So the aligning of teacher education to very specific ideas around how to prepare teachers um, to teach um, is, is something that's not taken South African context into consideration, but rather sort of border trends, I can say. Around, around educational reform and, and what it means. And, and this is very much aligned to the economy and what the, you know, uh, the, the economic needs of the country broadly. But then we've got a system in the country that of course differentiates between, you know, what is, I guess, considered functioning um, 
education system, which would include the private schools and would include um, X model C, which is the X white schools. And then you've got a cohort of schools that are still rural and under-resourced, township and under-resourced and overcrowded. Um, and, and so they, there's really much, and then of course, aligned to language, of course, this also language overlaps on the system. And so we, <laughs> it's one system with one curriculum, but the ways in which we train teachers, yeah, and all teachers go to the same institutions, etc. But when these teachers hit the classroom, how we um, deal with these teachers is absolutely different. Okay, so for, um, <laughs> for the majority of our in-service teachers, um, we, we basically tell them what to say and how to think and how to teach. We don't allow for any sort of um, creativity and professionalism in that sense. We leave the others alone. There's an assumption that they know what they're doing, but these teachers don't. And so this is this kind of reinforcement of, of the, 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 the abilities, I guess, that, and, and it's, you know, because it's, a, it's an historic reinforcement of, of, of difference, it starts to, you know, it, it's actually a racist assumption. I, I see it as racist. I see this, the way in which um, we treat our various different systems of education in reality, but in one, in, you know, in, 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 on paper, it's one system, but in reality, they, they're still different systems. Um, the way in which those are linked to, to race and the way in which those are aligned to class um, and very much reinforce old patterns. And then it feeds into this idea that children are, dis uh, we can, we dis disposable or, or, you know, we, we don't need everybody to succeed. We, we don't have jobs for everybody. So, you know, I mean, we don't really have to educate everybody very well. Um, we just need to make sure some are okay. And, and this plays out in every aspect I can think of of education, so it's the same curriculum, but you know, teachers are treated differently. Um, the 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 kinds of resources, languages are completely different. Um, and only now we're starting to make inroads into trying to equalize those kind of things, so that with that same curriculum, the provisioning is same. Because you put that curriculum in a private school and you put it in a school, you know, in in a rural school, and you've got two very totally different educational experiences and context is not taken into consideration. Um, so I think there's a lot coming up and I, I don't want to, uh, I mean, there's certain things I want to explore further, but there's also one more thing that I feel we'd be remiss not to uh, bring to the table. Um, and that's the issue of, of gender. So thinking back to the apartheid um, uh, era, we had um, especially working class men being trained for a certain project, which was being of service to the mining sector by and large, or, or service to people who are of service to the mining sector. Um, but women had a different role, and women were meant to stay at home and look after families, but also to, to sometimes work within that context in, in different kinds of jobs and sectors. So did you want to say a little bit about, um, you know, the right to education in, in South Africa historically with regard to gender, with regard to, to women, especially to access it? Um, I think it's a really important question and, and it's embarrassing that I, I don't know more about it. It's, it's definitely a blind spot, I think, in the ways in which we understand education through a gender lens, lens. But I mean, I think, you know, men, men went to work, uh, migrant labor systems, they, they left the homelands, the Bantustans, and they, what was left behind were the women and the children. And, um, then, then I spoke of that tax, you know, um, the tax was imposed. So it, on the Bantustans, they had to pay a tax. And so the women had to engage in, in work, other work. They, was, they were already doing work and then they had to um, uh, earn money. And, and, so, and that money financed education in the Bantustans. And, and this is partly why um, uh, the, the Financially, it was so under-resourced. It's because the state didn't put funds into that education. It was purely financed by those uh, those those Bantustans and homelands, um, and um, and and so in, in a very indirect way, there's this 
um, this is link between sort of women's labor that helps to support a, a broader economic uh, system of, of exploitation um, and then so you know under provisioning of education and um, you know we have a very high attainment uh, attendance rate here in South Africa I mean most of our children attend school it's compulsory to attend school to the age of 15 and and we have something like a 93 percent attendance rate really in grade one um, of course this drops significantly significantly over the grades um, with with huge dropout rates along the way um, and and I mean I don't really know the statistics and and maybe this is a, a good reason to go and find out uh, the sort of gendered dropout rates and 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 what happens but what we do have is a huge unemployment um, of youth we have a massive massive amount of our youth and the figures are scary I, I think it was I don't know, 56 percent of our youth I don't even know uh, that numbers in my head but but huge amounts of our 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 children youth are coming through the schooling system, and then of course on the other end of it, um, there's nothing. Yeah, and then, uh, but this we understand because we live in a capitalist arrangement, and we understand that that this is inherent in that kind of a system. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I want to say for middle class South Africa, uh, black women are the, especially educated black women. Are, are sort of due to our, our political and uh, quota systems and all those kind of things are definitely um, given more space uh, than they were prior. But but these things are all relative because because you know you speak to any woman. I mean I'm in academia. I have very close friends in other industries, and and it's still we live in an, in a racialized society, gendered society, and in our society, you know violence against women is huge so so women still face huge amounts of um and the other i think the other thing the other thing that i want to maybe just touch on with the gender issue is um i i attended a, a webinar where uh youth women girls high school going age um in the western cape um spoke about the issues about attending school so often what happens now is because we have a spatial arrangement of apartheid still on the ground um people who are able to um can access schools in so-called better neighborhoods um and so then these girls have to take public transport and it's the um train or it's a bus or it's a taxis and every single girl they asked had a it was around gender-based violence had um, some form of abuse, sex, mostly sexual abuse, um, on transport um, that they could talk about, and not just sort of random events, but weekly experiences of this of, on the train, on the taxi, um, and so there's an additional burden, I think, because of the nature of, of the violence of our society against women and children um, that happens around schooling, um, especially across you know spatial divides that are there. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, mm. it's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely scary. It's definitely part of, um, part of the society. Um, and it's, yeah. as you say, I think we could all study, study some more. Um, that said, I, I want to, um, again, so, so where we were last week, we had a conversation with Dr. Anita Rampal from India, who spoke mm. about this sort of neoliberal assault on education in India and what it looks like. And we were able to distinguish between um, different educational models. And I want to um, do that and give you an opportunity to talk about your, what I think would be your preferred model. But let me sort of um, introduce that by talking about sort of where we are in the past or where we are at present. So I mentioned at the beginning um, that a traditional Eurocentric view of education is that not everyone deserves an education. It's that education is something for the elites, for the children of elites, um, primarily and, and to become, you know, the next generation of elites. That's one view of education. There's another view of education, which is that this is something, um, you know, basically because in the 19th century, especially as people have to go to work, they need a place to leave their kids, basically. <laughs> so you have the extension of, of the universality of education as, as sort of a, a, a daycare center. And the quality of it was almost irrelevant. You just, you had to keep the kids occupied because the, the parents were working insane hours. And this was after child labor was 
abolished because before that, before that, the, the child was going with the child with the parent to the factory and working for free practically. Um, so that's another view of education. Then you have an industrialist view of education, which I, I think is what the ANC claims to still follow at some level, which is that we are um, we are a developing country and we need to train a labor force to be the next generation of workers within the industrializing. You know, this is the the industrial policy sort of view of education. Um, and then there is the neoliberal view, which I think is the actual, despite what they say, the actual ANC policy, um, which is to say, look, the market will decide, you know, how many jobs there are. And, um, you know, schools should be run more like corporations. And there should be a lot of standardized testing, not because standardized testing works. We know standardized testing doesn't work, but because it's really easy for us corporate people to sort of measure. And we can put people into categories and that just makes our life easier, right? And then there's the, the model of education that I want to um, really focus on, which is um, this sort of Freirean sort of a, a, a view. Um, it's been, I, I mentioned Paulo Freire is one of the first people to sort of expound this theory, but Neville Alexander in South Africa is one of them as well. But many people, feminists as well, um, who have talked about education as a tool of emancipation, education as a way to make more fully complete human beings. And I wonder if it's mm -hmm. not so much of a stretch to ask you, you know, a little bit about what you think such a system should look like in the South African context, but perhaps more importantly, what are one or two or three things we can do to move in that direction today? Um, sure, what's the vision for South Africa? <laughs> um, I, I, first of all, maybe, I think it's important to separate schooling and education because I think that um, we've abdicated um, societal control of education to schools and I think that's part of our problem. Um, so, I mean, to expand the idea that education, to expand the terrain of education, okay? So to, to make more people more responsible for education, um, of our children, okay? And I think we need to say our children because in this country, we tend to say those children um, or there's children and then there's this normative idea of a child which is basically white middle class, English or Afrikaans speaking, okay? So our children in its diversity and entirety and to, to, to pull back public control of the education of our children. I think for me, that's, that's, really important and I think it, it's reflected in all the work that we've done so you know the idea that you don't only find education in a school you find it in a community you find it in a family you find it in a street you find it in a you know it's everywhere you know the, um, and then to to think about education for what what are we educating for um, and I think the answer to that question um, is both specific and general. And I think that we shouldn't presume to tell people um, in a community that's not ours um, why and what the education should be. But I do think there are, of course, um, educational goals that are necessary for everyone, okay? Um, and so um, with, I guess, those two broad principles in mind, um, that structures the work I do. Um, so um, I, I firmly believe in contextual education because I think that people live in a, in a situated place and they have to navigate their lives. And if we're thinking of uh, poor working class communities, um, that means they're navigating food insecurity. It means they're navigating, you know, violences of various kinds, including poverty. And they, 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 they're navigating things that unless you are living there, you couldn't know about those things in any meaningful way. And so um, the people doing the educating and the, the education that is engaged in, I think that has to be negotiated. And I, so for me, um, deep democratic ideals embedded within the process of education are also important because um, without it, um, you know, so it's more Freirean kind of a, a dialogue around what and why, uh, and who should be learning and teaching and et cetera. So those conversations are really central to my idea of, of a system. So, I mean, of course, you know, like I, I'm saying this and I'm like, how would you possibly do this across, you know, 
at scale because this is an NGO talk right now. How do we take this to scale? And I don't know. And <laughs> I, I don't want to think about how to take it to scale. I just want, I, if every community, if we could build educational um, provisioning, if we could support people to, to use what they have in their communities and for, the, for themselves to feel as though they have that knowledge because people have the knowledge. And, you know, school knowledge is one of so many different kinds, um, but we, we only elevate school knowledge. And I think, um, you know, this, this same sort of principles apply for me to language too. So, you know, um, I, I was speaking to Polly actually, who's on the call yesterday, and we were talking about how it's not that we're against standard language. Of course, we can't be against standard language, but you're not to the detriment of varieties and to the detriment of funny galores and the detriment of, you know, um, different registers of language. We can't be um, elitist about our language. We have to be open and inclusive. So, so that inclusivity for me uh, means we have to open up who educates. It means we have to open up a discussion on what we're educating on it, and, and take children's voices into consideration here. Because I think a big part of education is about the conception of the child um, and, and what we imagine children are able and not able to do um, and what we think they should learn and what, um, and, and at no point do we ask children anything. And then I think it extends to things like language and, um, and other things. So, so we, those are more principles than, than an actual, you know, uh, because I can't it'll look like it'll look, it'll look different for every single community, but those principles for me would remain the same anyway you'd build an education program of sorts, whatever that would look like. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I, I think one, um, I'll just feed back on, on what I'm hearing and then I'll, I'll ask, before I, I make my intervention, I'll just ask people, please, if you have any more comments or questions, now would be the time to ask them in the chat. I'm going to get to the ones that have been um, said in just a second. Um, but I just want to, I, I mean, one interpretation of what you're saying is that apartheid was oppression. Apartheid was a, a certain kind of an injustice. And uh, yes. the mistake that the ANC seems to be making when it comes to apartheid uh, education policy, but I think we can talk about almost any policy, is that they think you can move from extreme injustice to like, just like there's no there's no there's no middle step and there always is a middle middle step and the middle step is is sort of like um it's a recalibration it's it's a it it looks like it's it, this is the black lives matter moment it's right no one's saying that not all you know the, the the no one's saying that all lives aren't equally important but if you have systemic racism then it is really important to affirm that black lives yeah. matter. if you have systemic privileging of certain languages it is really important to invest in systems that promote those other languages that weren't prioritized, right? If you have systemic privileging of certain districts, right? It is really important to invest and promote and resource the districts that didn't get that resourcing, right? So this is the step that, that without that balance, you're never gonna have, you're never gonna be able to move to the third step, which is the sort of all, all lives matter step, which is the like, you know, all our languages are equal, all our races are equal, but you're never gonna be able to do that unless you deliberately take time to invest in the places that didn't get investment. Um, and this is the step that I think the ANC thinks it can skip, uh, but it's just, it's just not possible. It's, it's, not, it's never gonna work. Um, so with that, let me just see what we have in the chat box. Um, Sandy, who had to leave, um, says, uh, has this little gem. Of all the sins of apartheid, for me, the worst was what it did to worsen the system through race-based differentiation and thus cripple the options for black pupils generation after generation. Uh, then she apologized for leaving. Uh, Fezi Fani uh, says, and I can ask people, please, if you're making comments, switch that little blue uh, place where you're making comments to all panelists and attendees, if possible. Uh, if not, I will, um, I will, I will do that. Um, this is a comment from uh, Mrs. Chandra. Um, who visited Cape Town in 1969 as a child and experienced apartheid um, in the bus on a road. Even taxis would have a notice above stating whether a white or a black person was sitting. Uh, those images remain with me to this day. 
as at that time I was very confused. This is from a, an older uh, woman who is a, a very, has a privileged background in India, um, but she came to Cape Town in 1969 and, and really um, experienced apartheid and, and still uh, is affected by that. Um, Fezi Fani is saying um, about women's rights, women are given uh, opportunities to learn uh, and access quality education, but in accessing uh, those opportunities, they have to overcome cultural, class, and social barriers that would have them play in certain roles. Uh, there's a gap between the social reality of a woman and the educational opportunities, 100%. Um, Ram Murthy is talking about um, the taking of responsibility of education by the community or a group of people is not testament to support the state in its bid to abdicate um, its responsibility to the, to the right of public education. Um, yeah. Um, I think these are all helpful interventions. Um, there's one more question um, that's come up, which is, and it came up last week as well, uh, about whether there may be other examples that we could look to. Um, and I don't know, um, Aziz has mentioned um, uh, Aotearoa in, in New Zealand and, and Canada. I know a bit about Canada. I, I don't know so much about New Zealand, but um, there may, are there other examples of places that have successfully done this um, you know, have moved from a, from a discriminatory system to a non-discriminatory system? Or, or any ideas on that one? Um, I mean, the power of sort of the hegemony of the global capitalist system, I mean, I don't know who escapes this, really. I, I mean, there might be small pockets of it, sure, um, and they would be independent and private. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Polly, they tried to set up a school, or they did set up, not tried, they did set up a school in Kailicha, uh, had to register it as a private school, but then operated it to the community. You know, the idea is a private school would mean sort of elite and, and, and you need to have money and all this, but they, they factored all this in and they tried, to, they did, they made it accessible to, as far as they could, to the community. Um, yeah. And, and, and the school exists, it, it's there. Um, there are, uh, there are ways, of course. Um, but I think these, it, it requires, um, it requires, it, it comes, it hits up against, constantly hitting up against the realities of, of our system. And, and so I know, for example, in the work I do, you know, we try and get community, well, no, we get, we don't try, we do get community members um, to, to help children develop their literacy and numeracy. And, and these are people who are not trained teachers, um, but, and, and they are unemployed because we, we pay, they get paid. But I mean, all of this, you know, the, the, the grant finished and, and the, these people are effectively unemployed, but still want to do this work. And, and so have to now play a game. They have to do the NGO thing, right? And they have to compete funding. And otherwise, how do you eat? And how do you pay your bills? And, and so there's always this kind of thing. And until we mobilize and get organized and we have broader support um, that includes financial support, uh, we're gonna struggle. Uh, we really are going to struggle. We can't attend to the educational issue alone. It's always connected. To, to people's lives and other things. So I, um, no, but that of course doesn't mean we don't try um, and we start to build what we can under the conditions we're in. Um, and, and we just have to um, keep struggling. We have to keep trying, yeah. I think. Yeah. I just say that when, when people talk about best practice when it comes to education, the countries that usually come up are like Norway and Sweden, mostly Finland actually. So the, the scan, I mean, that, that are not really, I mean, there may be good examples of education, but they don't really translate to our context at all. Um, no. So, no. It, I mean, it does beg the question of how this could happen. Aziz is saying that uh, is what I suspected, which is that uh, Aotearoa and um, Canada are not really um, good examples. I imagine that, that the former, so, so um, you know, because there's a lot of emphasis in, in Aotearoa about um, the Maori culture and, and sort of um, some of the, the attempts to, um, for example, to, to lessen or to, to, to use indigenous cultures views of justice to replace uh, prison systems. 
is the work that I'm sort of the most familiar with. So I imagine that there may be some scope for doing that um, in, in what is uh, what most people call New Zealand. Um, but I'm afraid Canada is, 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 not, um, is very much within the grips of, of the neoliberal uh, norm. And I imagine uh, New Zealand is as well. Um, so I think it's something that we have to build. Um, any other um, questions, comments are, are still welcome. Um, the chat box is open. Or did you have anything to add, uh, Nadima? No. No. Uh, no. no that's, uh, uh, I mean, I think you know, if we look at more radical examples like the Kappa Zapatistas and um, you know those kind of examples, they've you know even having physical isolation from they've had to completely isolate themselves from you know the rest of the well as much as they could from the rest of the world in order to implement, you know, as, as one of the prerequisites for being able to structure an education system that aligns to their way of life. But I mean, you know, who, to, to be able to disassociate communities from the world in order to build alternatives is, is I don't think, a recipe for most of us. I think we have to figure out ways of connecting to broader struggles because, um, you know, I mean, that's how societies are changed. You, you can't ever fight on one plane and you have to, um, we have to start organizing. I, I just, I can't, you know, political education linked with sort of useful um, community driven and community led education, which doesn't exclude the school. I mean, I don't want to come across as anti-school. I'm not, I, I work in pre, I work in teacher education. Um, but, I, you know, this idea that schools are islands. Um, we have to connect communities to schools and schools to communities and, and, and we need to connect those to broader issues around, like I said, food security, um, water, access to water, um, you know, unemployment issues. All those things have to be part of our struggle. We can't just struggle for language. We can't just struggle for, you know, education provisioning. We have to think broader than that if we're hoping to make a change because they're all connected and um, uh, I think that that kind of political um, education and that kind of strategic sort of uh, um, leadership I think it's missing I think that a lot of people you know Wendy Brown wrote that really great book on doing the demos you know the, the, it, it, it sinks into your mind and we, we it's the only way in which people can think is through this um, this this kind of market vision, and and this is how people. Um, this is what's happened. I, I think whole communities can't see any other way. Um, um, but yet, still within that, there are huge pockets of resistance, and we have to connect to those. Thank you so much, Nadima, once again, um, <laughs> and to all the participants who are here and staying with us. There are some people who have joined from countries where it's very late, but they're still here. Uh, there are also people watching on, on Facebook. Please do share this webinar. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You will see this, our logo, Peace Vigil, which is a vigilant eye. It says peace needs all of us. So you can easily find us on YouTube. And uh, please like us on Facebook, very easy to do. I'm sure you like this webinar. There was nothing to not like in it, I'm sure. So please, uh, please do like it. And you know, you can go to our website, peacevigil.net to get more information.